I'm Sharon Betters, and this is the Help and Hope podcast produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. We try to offer help and hope, especially to those who are hurting, and this uh, resource is designed to address those really hard places in life that are often experienced in isolation or difficult to talk about or difficult for people to know how to come alongside of that hurting person. And so I am very excited to introduce to you Pam Benton. Pam's husband, Wilson, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And unless you are in that crisis of life or have a loved one, you probably don't realize that over 5 million Americans are diagnosed with Alzheimer's every year. And there are 16 million caregivers who are just caring for their loved ones day after day and often by themselves. And so I've asked Pam to share with us her story. Pam and Wilson have been married almost 58 years at the time that we are having this conversation. Wilson was a pastor for many years and Pam was an amazing sidekick. I met Pam over 25 years ago and she has become a very special friend. So Pam, thank you so much for joining us. I'm glad you're here. Me too. As I said, we met over 25 years ago, and I remember clearly how you just took me under your wing in women's ministry. Uh, We were part of the national board for the women's ministry of our denomination, and none of us really knew what we were doing. And so we kind of hung on to each other. And you were like a Pied Piper, especially with younger women. You just exuded so much joy and fun, and you really helped me learn how to laugh again after the death of our son, Mark, and so you are very dear to me. Tell us a little bit about your family right now. Well, that is an amazing blessing because during all this season of life, our family, all of our children and grandchildren are well. Our youngest daughter is in Virginia. Uh, her husband is head of all the ministries of RUF, and they are there, and they are well. And my daughter Paige, who's a Bible teacher, is here with her three kids. And our son and his wife and four boys are in Mississippi. And praise God, they are all well. The college ones, the elementary ones, and everything in between. There's nothing like grandkids. We're so excited. We added one this summer because our oldest grandson got married. So now we have 11 grandchildren. And they are just as much grandchildren as the ones that were already there. You and Wilson uh, served. Wilson was a pastor. And I know that you really were a partner in ministry with him. What did you enjoy most about being a pastor's wife? And what was most challenging for you? I really, really loved being a pastor's wife. And Sharon knows this. I had told the Lord when I was in in high school, that um, I would go anywhere he wanted me to go and do anything he wanted me to do, but I could never be a pastor's wife because I would get him fired probably in 10 minutes because I didn't think I was the type to be this sweet, quiet, behind the scenes person. And God surprises us in so many ways. And I'm so thankful for that because I have truly loved this life of working alongside Wilson. And I think one of the greatest blessings is the fact that we worked together. We shared love for people. We were able to be together in the lives of so many people. And, uh, and I miss that. That's what been one of the hardest things for me in retirement is not being the senior pastor's wife because that's what I had always been. And I was thinking about it this morning earlier, and I'm really not sure that there were parts that were very, very hard for me. God had given me the gifts that work well in ministry. I love to teach. I'm a singer. I love, I did children's choir for 500 years or so. And I was involved with the women in ministry and discipling the seminary wives and all those kinds of things that I just loved and loved. I, I guess when I talk about how wonderful it all was, Wilson sometimes looks at me and says, were we together? Were you there? Because for the pastor, it's not, it's not always that easy. And working with, with a session and a diaconate and wanting to be submissive to them and to, you know, to what they are directing, we went through some r- real trials in, in our churches. But somehow or another, in the midst of it all, because of the community of the, of the church, I felt so encased in love by them 
And all I could do really was sit back and pray for Wilson at those times because they really involved, they didn't involve me so much. But I'm so glad God made me a pastor's wife. Well, that is very refreshing uh, to hear. And uh, I myself was a pastor's wife for almost 50 years. And I loved most parts of it. There were hard places, but I experienced joy and love from the congregation in uh, unique ways. And so you and Wilson retired. How many years were you in ministry when you retired? And what were your plans for when you retired? I'm not sure how long we've been in ministry. After graduate school, so long, probably 35, 40 years, something like that. And our plan was when we retired from the Cork of the Hills in St. Louis, we had been there for 23 years. And when we retired, we were going to be working some with the seminary and we were going to be working, Wilson was going to be working with churches, revitalization out of Briarwood. And so our plans were all set. And about three months later, we got a call from Christ Presbyterian Church in Nashville, and they were going through a really hard time. And our plan was not to take a church. But that was not God's plan. And so they called us here to be basically a full-time interim. And we said we would come for 18 months. And Wilson was here for five years, which was a surprise to us. So we added another five years of pastoral ministry, which we really, really love. And so our plans for retirement were not God's plans for our retirement. And we are thankful. So that kept us in Nashville. And so we we retired here. When did you first start noticing that something seemed off with Wilson? Right about two months before he was going to be retiring from Christ Pres. I began to notice repetition, which I had noticed in his mom. Both of our moms had Alzheimer's. And I noticed that kind of repetition. And as it got in December and January, before he was going to retire, the end of February, it became more noticeable. I I told him that there were things that could be done, that it might be depression, because it was a hard time. The church was calling a new pastor, and there were some things going on that were pretty, pretty tough. And so I told him that if we could go to a doctor, that there, you know, might be things that they could do. And I was just praying that it really was you know, depression. Mm -hmm. And so about a month before he retired, uh, we received that diagnosis. Was it hard for you to get him to go to a doctor? Because it seems like that it's, it wasn't hard. He had noticed. Right. The the thing I did not realize is that the staff that he worked with every day at church had really known for longer than I had, because they were noticing him not being able to do the things or remember the things in the office Mm -hmm. that he had before. And so when I went to them to tell them, they, not one of them was shocked. After the diagnosis, what was the biggest immediate change that you faced? And then how about long range? What kind of changes did you have to make? We caught this disease pretty early on. And so there were not a lot of changes that had to be made right away. The main thing was the emotional reality of what was before us and and the grief of that. But he was still pretty much fully functioning, just repeating things and not remembering some things. But we continued to travel and do and go. And he did a couple of weddings after that once or twice he was speaking at things and I was a little bit nervous and he had begun. One of the main differences is that he had begun to use notes. Wilson had never used notes in the pulpit before. So those were kind of the immediate changes that, that happened. But other than that, it was all pretty, you know, pretty much the same because it normally is a very slow progressing disease if you've caught it early. How long ago was his diagnosis? It was um, eight years ago last spring, so eight and a half years. So one uh, one big takeaway, I think, from our conversation is uh, that when we notice things like this, we shouldn't we shouldn't wait. No. And I think a lot of people really do live in somewhat denial for a long time. And that is not 
not a good thing. A, a dear friend of ours, his mom has recently died, but she was showing all these symptoms and his dad would not admit it. And so by the time they really admitted it, she had to go almost straight into a nursing home because he could not take care of her. And we have been very blessed in that way. Yeah, because today there are medications that can slow down the progression and um, be helpful. They are. They're helpful. They, they certainly don't cure anything. But immediately Wilson got on all these things. And he, you know, he has been on them now, you know, for all these years. I'm trying to imagine myself if I heard this diagnosis. Um, I, I imagine that I'd be fearful that I, you know, the unknowns, what does the future hold? Did you struggle with uh, fear or anger or disappointment, depression? And if so, how did you handle that? Well, I, I was, I was so sad and God made me so that depression is not something that I'm inclined to at all. I had never suffered with depression. Certainly, you know, anxiety over things, as you always do, but we immediately also, we didn't try to keep it a secret. And that's one of the things that I would highly recommend to people is almost immediately, I mean, within a month of his diagnosis, there were about 30 close friends, many of them not here in town, that we immediately sent out a letter and told them what was happening and asked them to pray. You know, lots of our friends from previous churches, minister friends, you know, all that. And people have been so faithful to pray. In the last two days, the last 24 hours, two old friends that he has mentioned missing, missing, which is unusual for him to be able to call a name. I had called them and, and said, you know, would you call him and, and just check in? And in both cases, they pray for us every day. So I know that there really are a lot of people that are praying for us. And that has made huge difference for me. I did go to the doctor about a year after he was diagnosed. And I really thought I was drowning, just trying to, to keep up with everything. And my doctor gave me something to help a little bit with functioning and being able to cope. And I, I guess it has. I mean, you know, because I, by and large, I, I have been fine. Well, I think that um, I'm glad to hear you say that, because I think that there are a lot of people, especially Christians, who feel as though if they have to take medication, then there must be yeah. their faith isn't strong or something like that. But after the death of our son, Mark, uh, I remember going to the doctor. It was like two, two years, maybe even three years later. And he looked at me and he said, you're in a depression. And right. I thought, well, I'm just grieving. He said, no, right. this, this is different. And he gave me a medication just to help my body function again. It was really something physical that happened in my body so that uh, there were disconnects. And I'm so grateful. Me too. And God provides those things. He does. So we do not have to be afraid of, you know, of being involved with some medicines that are good. That's right. So what for you has been the biggest change? I mean, I know that you, you are very people oriented. You enjoy interacting with people. You probably have a gazillion people who think they're your best friends, but now you are caregiver for your husband. What has been one of the biggest changes that uh, you have had to make in your own life? The thing that, that we have tried to do from the beginning is stay very involved and very active in our small group at church, in our Sunday school class, all those things. We traveled. We have done, I guess, three big overseas trips during those years. Now, it's been three years since the last one. I don't know that we'll ever be able to, you know, to do that again. But we really were still very involved with people. Men in the church would pick him up and take him to lunch. We've got friends that take him hiking every week. And, uh, but the, it's been COVID that has really changed everything. And it's, it, I'm telling you that that has been awful for him. I mean, he has declined more in the last six months than he had declined in the last four or five years. And it's, it's the isolation. I mean, he is just lonely for friends. It has just been such a reminder that God did not intend that we not live in community. He made us for community. 
So I'm, I'm trying to do that some with him, but it's really getting harder. It's, it's everything that we do now is harder because he has declined so much. I think about how much you love teaching the Bible study and mm-hmm. spiritual mothering has been such an important, I mean, it's in your, in your blood. I think you see a young woman and you're like a magnet. You're ready to, to be friends. That joy and that calling, I imagine, has changed as you have cared for Wilson and maybe even more in the last six months. Of course, COVID has certainly done a number on that. How do you handle that? Are you still involved with mentoring and Bible studies? Are you, are you still able to keep that going in your life? For a number of years, I, I had a group of young girls that I met with every week and loved them and you know, mentored them and led them more, almost more than teaching them. And then that kind of, as their children got older, you know how that goes, that, that kind of fizzles when they are all in school. So since that time, I've had another group that wants me to lead a Bible study for them, which we're, I think we'll start in September if we can. COVID is just making it really hard. But I am still trying to maintain relationships with some of these girls. And it's interesting that actually this week I'm having lunch with three of my young friends. Now that's a bit unusual because a lot of times I have lunch with my peers, but I have, you know, reached out to these three girls and, and had had lunch with one yesterday and one the day before and one tomorrow. And I'm still involved with the women's Bible study at our church and we we will be doing that live starting next month. So I am I'm I am trying to keep doing that. But church has shut down almost, you know. So we're zooming Sunday school and that kind of thing. And that does not get it for him. He cannot concentrate on a screen. Yeah, that's so challenging. But what I appreciate about what you're saying, Pam, is that you're being so intentional that you are staying connected on purpose. And I think as caregivers the 16 million caregivers, how oh. important is it for you to make sure that you take a break without guilt, you know that you are taking care of yourself and you know that as you do that, you're going to be better able to care for your husband. Right. And that does make all the difference. You've talked a lot about the church and I think it's, you know, it's kind of a redundant question because I think you've already answered it, but staying connected to your church and your covenant family has been critical for you. What if there is someone who maybe they were in a church and they haven't been able to attend because their spouse just can't handle it anymore? They feel very isolated from their church. What can they do? Is there anything they can do to try to stay connected to the church? And what can churches do to make sure that people who are caregivers don't fall between the cracks and are just forgotten because they don't show up? Well, I think like in so many other things, I don't want anybody else being critical of the church if they're not in it. But you and I have been in it. We can be honest about things. And I think certainly one of the areas that the church often fails is in the area of taking care of the ones who can't be there or the ones that don't reach out to them for help. And I I know churches handle this in a different way, but I think that even right now with all this COVID going on, that to, to take advantage of anything that the church has that is is online. I mean, Zoom Sunday school classes, Zoom small groups. One of my dearest friends is grieving over the loss of her husband six months ago during COVID. And they are considerably younger than we are. You know, it's just been a nightmare because she is cut off at this time when nobody could even be at the funeral. And I know that she has felt that the church has not really reached out to her very much. Of course, it bothers me because I've been, they have not been here that long and I have been here that long, but I'm not part of the church decisions anymore. But I think the church can do a better job of soliciting people who maybe are not even on staff to reach out to caregivers. Caregivers really do need to be loved on. They really do. I resonate with what you're saying. And I think that one of the things that we can do is remember that 
Well, there's, there's two ways that I think this need can be met. One is through an organized program, right? as you mentioned, where this is intentional. The leadership asks people to take this on as their ministry and their calling and how incredibly wonderful that is. And then the second is for us to remember that we are the church. You and I are the church. And like exactly. you, out, you are uh, filling that gap and we have that opportunity to be the church and to step in, especially when we're facing like this pandemic, to think about those who are by themselves or who are caring for a loved one uh, by themselves and don't have that physical connection, we can step into the gap. And so I, I appreciate, I love, I love the way your church is taking care of you and Wilson. I love the way the men are surrounding him. I think that's unique. I think it's unusual. But I think if any men are listening or watching that, I would urge you to be intentional about connecting with other men in this way. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. So when I think about your situation, I know that you have experienced incredible blessings. I know that your faith is deep. How do you stay focused and rooted in the truth that God is sovereign and you can trust him? Sharon, that's when the blessing of growing up in a Christian home and in a great church and being well taught. I was on the phone with a friend this morning who's our age and we were sharing, he was sharing the the blessing of at night being able to lie awake and recite the Psalms that he's memorized. And God's word has been hidden in my heart for a very, very long time. But the hymns and the, and the songs that I have sung all of my life come to my mind. I mean, I think of things like day by day and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. You know, I can quote that whole four verses of that, but that kind of thing. And this morning, I was actually thinking of the one that says, he giveth more grace as the burdens grow greater. He giveth more strength as the labors increase. To added affliction, he added his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. And, and I say that, and I believe that, and I believe that's based on the truth of God's word. And so that, you know, reminding myself of what is true. And I've got, I've got precious children who know the Lord and they can be rough on me sometimes and remind me of things that I know to be true. You know, if I start whining to them. Uh, and reminding me of just God's graciousness in our lives for so, 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 so long. And then I would encourage people who might be listening to this. I have not been in a lot of support groups because they made it strange times for me. But when I do go to a support group and there are numbers of them around, I always come home thankful because most everybody's situation with a husband with Alzheimer's is worse than mine. And I need to be reminded of that. You know, Wilson is sweet and thoughtful, and um, he has become more of who he is in terms of being a gentleman, of being loving, of being affirming to me. And yes, he's sick. And yes, there really are very hard times. But um, he is still at this point, able to take care of a lot of things for himself personally. And so many people from early on can't do that. So I, the more I get out and about, the more grateful I am. Stick, being here and being isolated is not a good thing for me. Well, Pam, you have shared so much really good stuff, good practical wisdom. And I know that in the months and years after the death of our son, Mark, I wanted to hear from somebody ahead of me in the journey. Call back that God is sovereign and you can trust him. And you are doing that for those who are coming behind you, telling them that there is mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace, as we know Jesus. As we wrap up, I'd love for you to imagine that you're at one of your lunches with one of your friends and she has just learned that her husband has Alzheimer's. What uh, comfort or wisdom would you share with her? One of the things that I would definitely share is the fact that God gives us one day at a time and he makes it very clear that we are to live today, that we are to focus on today. And that doesn't mean that we don't make plans for the future, but 
to be fearful about what's going to be next is not a good thing with this disease. You know, you need to be just so grateful for the things you can do. And I, I'm preaching to myself for the things that you can do now and, and, and not be anticipating what's going to happen next. And that's hard. It's hard not to do that. You know, you're, you, you just cannot imagine the day that your husband won't know who you are. And we're to the stage now where Wilson cannot always recognize our children. When he's with them, he knows that they're ours, but he cannot always call their names. And if he sees a picture, he's not sure who they are. And, you know, that's heartbreaking. But to, to imagine what's going to be next is, is not a good thing. And yet I really do have to plan. I mean, you do have to be aware of things like having long-term care insurance and having you know, a plan for if you need to get help. And now I have, I have a girl that comes in one day a week for all day long and stays with him. So I have two days a week out, the, the hiking day and, the, and that help day. And that is, that's a blessing. And I encourage people, if they need help, go get it. Don't try to do it all yourself because it will wear you out. Well, I really resonate with so much of what you're saying. Reach out, get help try not to worry about what's coming. I imagine that maybe you have to lean into that, the grief of it all, but then come to that point of, you said it earlier, you focus on what you do know about the Lord and not on what you don't know. Each day has its own trouble. We really have to choose I, and it's hard. I don't think anybody listening to this should think that we're saying that this is easy, this is painful. And I know that if somebody had told Pam and Wilson 15 years ago that this was going to be part of their journey, they would have said no. Uh, for control freaks and people who don't like the unknown, that's really painful. But once you get there, you say, yeah, you're a wise and loving God, totally. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Pam, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your beloved husband, Wilson. I, I mean, I always knew by the way you talked about Wilson when I saw you together, how much you adore one another and how much you love one another. And it's such a treasure for you to be sharing some of your journey with us now. And I know that there's someone who, many someones who are going to be encouraged and their hearts are gonna be turned toward Jesus because of what you have shared today. My name is Sharon Betters and you have been listening to the Help and Hope podcast produced by Mark Inc. Ministries. And my guest has been Pam Benton. And if you go to markinc.org, you will find more stories like Pam's where the hope of the gospel is very clear in some of the most painful and difficult circumstances and life crises that we can imagine. We are so grateful for the hope and the help that Jesus gives to us. No matter how dark, there is a light and that light is Jesus. Thank you again for listening. Go to markinc.org where you're going to find more resources like this one. 